I trust you're in 1 Kings chapter 22. Thankful for Doug for reading much of that text so we don't have to read through it. We will read selected texts as we make our way through this tonight. First Kings 22, well, as you're making your way there, if you're not there yet, um, last month um, in Pennsylvania in the United States, an explosion at a chocolate factory killed seven people. And a lawsuit filed just a few weeks after that happened claims that the factory owners must bear some responsibility for this because they had ignored warnings of the impending disaster. About 30 minutes before the explosion, one of the workers had reported smelling gas. And according to the lawsuit, the management did nothing. Well, investigations are ongoing, but it will prove to be a sad, though not unprecedented, reality if indeed warnings had gone ignored. Humanity has a long track record of ignoring warnings of impending judgment and suffering the consequences. And the text before us gives us an example of that. The text before us gives us an example of how Micaiah warned the king of Israel and the king of Ju Ju um, Judah that disaster was um, coming, and yet they ignored it. This is really the writer's burden in this chapter. If you wanted to to take from this story and summarize the writer's burden from the story in a single sentence, it's simply this. Those who disregard God's truth are destined for destruction. That's what the writer is teaching us here. And by recording the showdown between wicked King Ahab and a lesser known prophet, our, our hidden figure for this evening, Micaiah, the writer contrasts a faithful response to God's truth with a series of unfaithful responses to God's truth. And then he shows us how God, in his truth, responds to those who reject his truth. Now, there's a lot here in these 40 verses, and we're going to move very quickly through them. Um, good luck for keeping up with the outline up there, Tyron. Um, we'll see as we move along. The first thing we see here in verses 1 to 28, the first major section of this text, is what I've called the response to truth. The response to truth. Now, as I've said, the writer's major burden is to show that those who disregard God's truth are destined to be destroyed by it. And he sets up this lesson by showing, Ahab, showing us Ahab and Ahab's faithless prophets and Micaiah, a faithful prophet, all responding in different ways to God's truth. And in these 28 verses, we see at least four distinct responses to truth which happen here and which all too often happen in our own world today. The first of those in verses 1 to 6 is what I've called a flippant response to truth. Now, again, we're not going to read all of these verses, but we see here a flippant response to truth in verses 1 to 6. The writer, again, sets up the reader for the entrance of our hidden figure, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by highlighting the flippant manner with which Ahab and Ahab's prophets treated the word of God. Israel's king Ahab and Judah's king Jehoshaphat, they had formed an alliance by marriage. Jehoshaphat's son had married Ahab's daughter, and so these two nations were allied to each other, which wasn't a great thing in the first place, but it is what it was. And when Ahab wanted to go to war to recapture Ramoth Gilead from Syrian control, he knew exactly where to go for allies. And so he called, he called Jehoshaphat and he said, will you join me? And Jehoshaphat said, well, we, we are allies. Yes, we'll go up together. But Jehoshaphat, who was far more um, sensitive to the leading of Yahweh than Ahab was, said, can we first ask for, for a word from Yahweh? Let's get a prophet of Yahweh to come in and give us Yahweh's guidance in this matter before we go. Well, Ahab was armed with prophets for just such an occasion. Um, if you know the story of Ahab, you know 1 Kings chapter 18, he had 400 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah. Well, he also had these prophets. These prophets were not rank pagans. They were more nominal prophets of Yahweh, prophets who were willing to invoke Yahweh's name when it, when it made sense to do so, when it was convenient to do so. And so he calls these prophets and he says to them, tell us, yes, King Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat wants to know, should we go up to Ramoth Gilead? And these prophets interestingly reply, yes, go up for the Lord. But you'll notice in, in, um, in verse 6 here when he says, um, go up for the Lord will give it. Um, they use the word, rather than Yahweh, they use the word Adonai. Go up for the Lord, capital L, small O, small R, small D, for Adonai will give it to you. A, a Jehoshaphat, as we will see, is going to see right through that. But the point, before we move on to, to anything else, the point here is that we see both Ahab and his prophets treat God's truth flippantly. 
Ahab kept his prophets on hand so that he could use them to invoke the name of Yahweh when it was convenient. And these prophets stayed on the payroll, willing to tell Ahab exactly wanted what he wanted to hear when it was convenient to do so. They professed allegiance to the truth, but really God's word was just a means for them to get what they wanted. And let me just say, little has changed in 3,000 years. There are still far too many Christians and far too many churches in our own country who treat God's word flippantly. They claim to be Bible-based churches, and yet the Bible really plays very little role in what they believe and what they teach. And people, professing Christians, flock to these churches because they know they can go there. They know the pastor will stand up front. He'll read from the Bible at least, but he won't really use it to confront them with the truth of God's word. They don't mind the pastor reading from the Bible as long as he doesn't teach its truth in a way that calls him to obey it. Ahab again kept these nominal prophets of Yahweh on his payroll because it may at times prove convenient to invoke Yahweh's authority in pursuing his own agenda. And too many Christians, too many ch Christian churches do the same thing. They pay lip service to Scripture to justify their own godless practices and teaching. A second response we see here in verses 7 to 12, a second response to truth is what I've called a forced response. This is highlighted here when um, the prophets come and they say, yes, go up because Adonai will give it into your hand. And Jehoshaphat immediately sees through this. And he's like, well, okay, I hear what they're saying, but this doesn't sound like a word of Yahweh. Isn't there a prophet somewhere, somewhere, one prophet of Yahweh that we can consult? And then as Doug read, of course, Ahab says, well, yeah, there is one guy, but I don't really like him because he never tells me what I, he's not like these prophets. He doesn't tell me what I want to hear. And Joshua says, no, just, just go call him. Let's hear what we're going to, let's hear what he says. And as they're going off to, to call uh, Micaiah, we're told here in verses 11 and 12 that Zedekiah, the son of Chenana, made for himself horns of iron. And he said, thus says the Lord, with these you shall push the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so and said, go up to Ramoth Gilead and triumph Yahweh will give it into the hand of the king. You see, suddenly they're invoking the name of Yahweh now because they realize that Jehoshaphat wasn't impressed with what they'd said before, so let's invoke the name of Yahweh. But as you read of Zedekiah's antics here, some, some have thought that this is just a, a rank pagan prophet. He's, he's, you know, I mean, he's a bull supporter. He's taking his horns and he's, he's goring. And it, this is just another prophet of Baal, but I don't think that's ha what's happening. I think there's something far more insidious going on here. I think what's happening here is that Zedekiah, recognizing that Jehoshaphat was not buying into his earlier prophecy, is now going to resort to a crude form of, of proof texting. Here's what I mean by that. Listen to this prophecy that Moses gave in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 17, concerning the people of Israel. Moses said, A firstborn bull, he has majesty, and his horns are the horns of a wild ox. With them he shall gore the peoples, all of them, to the ends of the earth. I think what Zedekiah is doing here is, he knows that Micaiah is on his way. He knows that Micaiah is going to bring the truth. And he's saying, Joshua, you don't need Micaiah. Let me tell you what the Bible says. Open your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 17. Let me show you. You, you have Yahweh on your side here. He's trying to persuade Joshua before Yahweh comes. What he's trying to do here is take the word of God and force it to say what he wants it to say. And again, very little has changed in 3,000 years. There are still too many professing Christians who take the word of God and try to force it to say what they want it to say. The world is filled with people who just proof text to force God's word to say what they want it to say. Their cars are protected by Psalm 91. They appeal to Proverbs 29 verse 25, which says, whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. And they claim this as a promise that nothing bad can possibly happen to me because I trust in the Lord, I'm safe. Now, let me just say that, of course, Christians and Christian churches want to appeal to Scripture in support of what they believe and what they teach and what they do. But there's a very big difference between quoting Scripture in its proper context after doing sufficient study and just taking a verse at random and using it to support what you wanted to say. That's what's happening here, I believe. And so we see a, a, a forced response. A third response from um, these, these prophets or, or, or from, from the story is what I've called a faithful response to truth. A faithful response. We see this in verses 13 to 23. And we come here to the highlight of the story in verse 13. The messenger who went to summon Micaiah said to him, 
Behold, the words of the prophets are with one accord favorable to the king. Everyone's telling the king exactly what he wants to hear. Let your word be like the word of one of them. Speak, tell him what he wants to hear. Speak favorably. But Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I will speak. Micaiah is the only character in the story who shows full fidelity to the truth of God and willingness to suffer for it. Even Jehoshaphat gets it wrong at some points in the story. But Micaiah understands something that Ahab didn't. Micaiah understands something that Ahab's prophets didn't. Micaiah understands that the prophet is subject to the word of God. You see, Ahab kept these other prophets on hand because he assumed that the prophet could determine the word of the Lord. Micaiah realized prophets cannot determine the word of the Lord. Prophets can only reveal the word of the Lord. And so what the Lord says to me, that I will do. We need to have the same attitude as Micaiah. Again, too many professing Christians assume that they stand above God's word. They'll submit when they agree with God's word, but the moment that God's word contradicts them, well, then I am the authority. I will determine what is right. I will determine what is wrong. Ahab comes, or Micaiah comes to Ahab, and initially he, he plays a bit of a game with Ahab. And he comes before Ahab and he says to Ahab, yeah, go up. Yeah, we will give it into your hand. And Ahab realizes, hang on, this is not looking good in front of Jehoshaphat. This guy's sounding a little bit too sarcastic right now. And so he says to him, no, no, Micaiah, how many times have we done this before? Just tell me what does Yahweh say? I'm interested in knowing what Yahweh wants me to do because that's what I'm going to do. And so Micaiah says, fine, you want to know what Yahweh says? Let me tell you what Yahweh says. He says in verse 17, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. In other words, you Ahab are the shepherd. As the king, you are the shepherd of Israel. But if you go to war, Israel's going to be without a shepherd. You're going to be killed in war. And inter interestingly, these have no master. Let them return to his home. Let each return to his home in peace. When you die, that'll mean peace for Israel because you're the one that has brought so much trouble to Israel. Ahab immediately complains to Joshua. See, I told you this guy never says anything good about me. And then Micaiah continues and he says, in fact, Ahab, let me tell you something else. I know that you're not interested in obeying God's word. And he launches into this vision that he had with the Lord sitting on his throne and the angels before him and the Lord looking for a way to deceive Ahab, to, to get Ahab to go up to Ramoth Gilead and to be destroyed. We see that we read that story. What we see here, what I want to focus on here is that Micaiah's attitude to the truth is the one that we should emulate. Because Micaiah... And by the way, let me say, Micaiah, like the Lord Jesus Christ centuries later, treated the word of God with the reverence that it was due. Like Jesus, Micaiah believed that God's truth was decisive and binding. Like Jesus, he believed that God's truth was authoritative and sufficient. Like Jesus, he believed that God's truth was true and certain. Like Jesus, he believed that God's truth was reliable and unbreakable. And we should have the same response to truth. But there is one more response to truth here. In verses 24 to 28, is what I've called a furious response to truth. Because as soon as, as Ahab and Ahab's prophets hear what Micaiah says, they respond angrily. And Zedekiah physically assaults Micaiah. And Ahab goes and has him cast into prison with meager rations of food and water until I come back and I show Micaiah that he was wrong. Micaiah, for his part, by the way, doesn't stand up to defend the word of God. He simply says, there is a way for us to know what is true. Let's see what happens. Let's wait. God's word in its time will defend itself. He knew that God's truth would vindicate itself at the end. And let me say, once again, many people in our world today are absolutely incensed when the word of God is preached, when the truth of God is brought to bear on the situation. And I'm not only talking about people out there. I'm talking about people in churches today. I've worked at this church office long enough to have seen people come into the office for counseling, sit in an elder's office, and within a few minutes storm down the corridor, out of the office, out of the gate, angry that God's truth has confronted them. People who are members of our church, or who were at one time members of our church, far too many people get angry when the word of God confronts them. The attitude of the prophets has not died. And so we see these four responses, these four possible responses there to truth. We can have a flippant response to God's truth. We can have a forced response to God's truth. We can have a faithful response to God's truth or a furious response to God's truth. But what happens in verses 29 to 40 in the, 
the, the second half of Micaiah's story is we see God's response, the, the response of the truth to these people that were rejecting God's truth. And we see briefly uh, two responses to truth toward those who resisted truth. And the first of those, again, we don't have time to read all these verses, but the first of those is what I've called a fulfilled response, or the fulfilled response to truth. In other words, God's word was fulfilled. Now, it's fascinating, as you read the story, Ahab was a great friend. And he knew enough of Micaiah to know that there's probably something to what Micaiah says. Micaiah usually is right. And so he says, hey, I'll tell you what, Jehoshaphat, when we go into battle, you know that they're going to chase the king. So why don't you dress up in your royal robes? I'll dress up like a normal soldier so that they'll chase you instead of chasing me. Now, obviously, he only did that because he thought that there might actually be something to Micaiah's words. And for whatever reason, Jehoshaphat's like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And so they go into battle, and we're told here that the king of Syria has ordered his army that you don't fight anyone else. You find the king of Israel, and you go after them. And so the soldiers are looking. There's someone that looks like a king. Let's go after him. And they chase him. And suddenly Joshua realizes this might not have been such a great idea. And so he screams out, and they realize, oh, no, hang on a second. This is not Joshua. Or this is not Ahab. Where is Ahab? We don't know where Ahab is. And perhaps Ahab is, perhaps Ahab's plan to overcome God's word has won the day. But then we're told that some random soldier, without taking aim, just pulls his arrow and he shoots. And it just so happens to go and strike Ahab right in the spot where Ahab will meet his demise. The point here is that God's truth stands and events unfolded exactly as God had warned. Ahab heard and ignored God's word and it destroyed him. Those who disregard God's truth are destined to be destroyed by it. When God speaks, he acts. We can be sure of that. And so when God warns in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, that there is a day of eternal destruction coming, when those who do not submit to the truth will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength, we can be sure that that is going to happen. That those who, who arrogantly resist God's truth will face destruction. Those who disregard God's truth are destined to be destroyed by it. But the wonderful reality is that the opposite is also true. The opposite is true, that those who embrace God's truth find life in it. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God's truth reveals that every human being is a sinner under God's wrath. But then in a, a, a lavish display of love, God sent His one and only Son so that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Those who disregard the truth stand condemned, while those who embrace it find forgiveness and salvation at the cross. God is true to His Word, and the choice before us is very simple. How will we respond to that truth? The way we respond to God's truth will determine the way in which God and His truth responds to us. And so we see there, first of all, the fulfilled response of truth. But then secondly, and finally tonight, we have what I've called, in verses 39 and 40, the focused response of truth. Just look at these closing words here. The writer says, Now the rest of the acts of Ahab, and all that he did, and the ivory house that he built, and the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Ahab slept with his father, and Ahaziah his son reigned in his place. The point of, of this section here, I believe, is that the writer is trying to say to you, I'm not interested in Ahab's accomplishments. If you want to know about Ahab's accomplishments, go read about them elsewhere. The writer of 1 Kings was interested in one thing, and that was Ahab's response to God's truth. In fact, as you read Ahab's story, the last three chapters here, there are three separate times when Ahab disregarded the truth of God. In chapter 20, he disregarded the truth of an unnamed prophet. In chapter 21, he disregarded the truth of, of Elijah. And now in, verse 20, in chapter 22, he disregards the word of Micaiah. He disregarded the truth of God, and because of that, he was destroyed. And the warning stands for us today. So again, let me ask you this as I bring this to a close. How will you respond to the truth of Scripture today? Will you respond flippantly? Perhaps interested in what it says, but without any form of commitment to obey it. Will you respond by forcing God's truth into your preconceived way of life? 
Will you respond furiously, angered when God's truth confronts your sin? Or will you, like Micaiah, and as I've said, like the Lord Jesus Christ, submit yourself to the teaching of Scripture, holding firm to the commitment, as the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I will speak, and that I will believe, and that I will do. If you're an unbeliever yet tonight, let me just say to you, you cannot even begin to submit to God's truth until you first submit to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's word says that as a sinner, you stand under his divine wrath and that the only means of escape from the penalty of eternal destruction is frank confession of your sin as you embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior. But the promise is if you do that today, you can receive forgiveness at the cross. You can receive eternal life. And then together, we can commit to walking in glad and humble submission to the authority of God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word, and we ask that you would just now take it, apply it to our hearts, enable us to obey it this week. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.